May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight. O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Our scripture in Acts begins with Peter addressing a crowd of people who wonder how they, Peter and John, made a man walk. It's a great place to start if you already know the story of the miracle at the beautiful gate. But not, not all of us know that story. And so, like the crowd, you might be wondering what just happened. So let's back up a little bit. Peter and John, disciples of Jesus, went to the temple to pray about three o'clock in the afternoon. While they were on their way there, a man who never walked was carried to the gate called Beautiful, where he'd been carried daily to beg. The man saw Peter and John and he asked for alms or food or money that's given to the poor. Peter and John focused on this man and they said, look on us. And the man did. He was expecting to get something. Peter said, silver and gold I don't have but what I do have, I will give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, get up and walk. Then Peter extends his right hand to the man and raises him up. Immediately, the man's feet and ankles were made strong. I wonder if it was something like the runner's high that people get when they're feeling invincible. I've only felt that once but it's an amazing feeling to have a surge of strength go through you and you feel like you can do anything. And I'm wondering if that's what that man felt that day. So the man is now walking and he goes with Peter and John into Solomon's portico. This creates quite a commotion as the crowd recognizes the man who had always been lying outside on the ground, begging for alms, is now walking and leaping and praising God and Peter saw this commotion and the crowd that's utterly astonished and in wonder. And this is where our passage begins. Peter seizes the opportunity and he names what people are thinking, that they're amazed and that they also assume that Peter and John have made this man walk due to their own power or religious diligence. But Peter clarifies it for them, starting at a space where they understood and in our initial reading, it sounds pretty harsh. This passage has been used to justify atrocities against Jewish people who in this passage are linked with the crucifixion. It is a bitter history that we as Christians need to remember, learn from, atone for, and never repeat, first with the Jewish children of God and then all children of God. Because if we skim the surface, and look at it through the lenses of our own experience, we make judgments that are inadequate at best, oppressive, harmful, or deadly at their worst. Peter is not giving a Christian lecture to Jewish people. At this time, the followers of Jesus were Jews and those from around the world who had gathered in Jerusalem for commerce and for the festivals. Peter and John were Jews in a Jewish space talking to their fellow Jews who were also diligent in their faith. I mean, after all, it's three in the afternoon and they're at the temple. Peter and John are not condemning a foreign group, but he's addressing their spiritual family with the faith and heritage they share as part of the lineage of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, serving God who led their mutual ancestors out of the wilderness by mighty signs and wonders using their common history, the common language reminiscent of Isaiah, this God, their God, had a suffering servant named Jesus. It is likely this audience would have known the characteristics of this suffering servant, this person whom they longed for, who would free them from the yoke of oppression. From Isaiah, the suffering servant is sent on a mission from God, the mission involves suffering on behalf of another. Although the servant will suffer and be rejected, he will in the end be exalted and vindicated. Finally, his suffering would, be, would bring justice, salvation, and blessing to all nations. With that picture and understanding in the minds of the crowd, P 
Peter equates the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus the Messiah as the one they were looking for. This miracle of the man walking is to validate who Jesus is. And Peter goes farther. Although through a terrible mixture of injustice and ignorance, the servant of God is killed, God, their God, raised Jesus from the dead, and Peter and John could attest to that fact. Peter is with this man who was once on the outskirts, needing help just to barely get by with the scraps from society. A man who was without strength or resources is now with them in perfect health that the whole people can attest. Peter doesn't invite the listeners to walk in shame. He doesn't invite them to be consumed with guilt. He doesn't invite them to study the Torah or the prophets a little more. He doesn't suggest they gain greater, greater education at the feet of notable rabbis to understand the wisdom books. They already know enough to take the next step. Instead, Peter invites them to repent in the wake of two miracles, the resurrection of Jesus from the dead and the restoration of the man who once lived outside the gate, pitied by society, but now walks, leaps, and praises God from within their midst. Instruction is easy, and we're good at that. As Peter noted, ignorance doesn't give us a pass, so it's important that we learn. But instruction and education can only take us so far. Repentance is hard. It's not for the arrogant, the proud, or the weak. Repentance requires humility. It takes a willingness to admit that we don't know it all, that our careful reasoning has led us into error and not truth, harm and not wholeness, evil and not goodness. Repentance calls us to question what we know, what we have learned, what we as individuals and as a society accept as inevitable, things that make our life easy, the dumb idols that we worship, the false gods we serve, and even what our parents have taught us. Repentance involves deep sorrow for our misdeeds and our moral failures. It creates role strain and internal conflict between the person we desire to be, the people around us know us to be, and the person that we really are. And if we are courageous enough, True repentance requires that we change our attitudes, actions, and what we hold dear, even our very ways of being. It will cost us our ideals, our friendships, and a vision of Jesus that we've made over into our image as though we were the divine creator instead of the created ones. This kind of internal reflection is not easy or quick. It is painful and it is ongoing but it is the call of Jesus to those of us who choose to follow him. We repeat it every time we say the Lord's prayer in the phrase, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We reaffirm it in our baptismal covenant when we persevere in resisting evil and whenever we fall into sin, repent and return to the Lord. We note it as we seek to serve Christ in all persons, striving for peace and justice and respecting the dignity of every human being. It's something we can only do with God's help. The call to repentance is not an easy call. It opens up a future that we could not enter into any other way. And it brings the kingdom of God into our communities. This was not an easy sermon to write. With a backdrop of the grief of mothers still burying their children due to police brutality, families grieving over the deaths of mass shootings, children whose education has been permanently disrupted and damaged by the pandemic, elders who are food insecure and families who are homeless, despair is, a welcome, is an unwelcomed neighbor, deeply unwelcomed neighbor who often knocks at my door. The enormity of the tragedies 
threaten to overwhelm any of us who choose caring, love, and empathy over callousness. What can we do? We can pray for courage and love. We can repent of the evil we do, the evil we profit from, and the evil done on our behalf. We can stop and notice the horrors around us and stop acting in ways that it has always been this way and can always be this way. We can refuse to believe the lie that some of our members of our society are disposable or worth less. We can stop expecting people with no shoes to pick themselves up by their bootstraps. We can honor indigenous wisdom, value music that seems strange to our ears and learn from people who survive with so much less. We can interrogate our images of Jesus for accuracy and invitation. We can stop and reach out with the resources that we have been given. We can respond not with the scraps that people ask for, since that is the only thing they've been offered, but we can respond with the transformative loving power of the resurrected Christ that turns death into abundant life. We can't do everything but we can do something. The church will reopen. We will need ushers, acolytes, readers. We have outside ministries like the second week of Friday where we bring food to elders or the second week of May when we help family pro promise. We can't do everything, but we can do something. And I invite us to start from the inside out. I invite us to start with repentance because it's not just for Lent, it's for the resurrected life we live. Alleluia, Christ is risen. Let's go forth in the power of a resurrected Lord. Amen.